Welcome to Approaching a Patient with Intermittent Claudication. My name is Anaita Dua. I'm an assistant professor of surgery at, in the Division of Vascular Surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, I'm also an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, and I love patients with intermittent claudication. So I'm here to give you a little talk about how to approach a patient that you may see in your clinic or in the emergency department who presents with these types of symptoms. To begin with, let's talk a little bit about what intermittent claudication actually is. So intermittent claudication is just a fancy medical way of saying that you have cramping, especially in your calf muscles, during what we call exercise or walking. It impacts approximately 5% of the general population, and typically a patient will say that they normally, when they're sitting at rest, have no pain, but as soon as they start walking after maybe a mile, half a mile, 10 steps, they suddenly have severe cramping pain that that is in their calf muscle. That cramping pain is alleviated if the patient sits down and takes a rest. The reason that this occurs is because in these patients there's a buildup of plaque within the actual arterial wall that decreases the amount of flow that can get to the distal aspect of the foot, the toes, or even the, the um, aspect of the calf when the patient is walking. As a result, the patient develops pain, very similar to as if you were working out in the gym and you suddenly develop pain while you were doing too many reps of biceps curls. The management of this disease is typically conservative, including a walking program, differences in the medication for the patient, and a modification of some risk factors, including smoking cessation or control of diabetes. One of the fundamental goals of patients with intermittent claudication is to avoid procedures. There's a paper that recently was published that showed that in patients who undergo procedures for intermittent claudication versus just the conservative management I spoke about, they go on to have more problems and more procedures. And so ideally, unless the patient presents with what's called lifestyle limiting claudication, claudicans should really be managed conservatively. When you have an intermittent claudicate patient in your office, they're going to be asked particular questions to really elicit the history. For example, a 62-year-old male, usually a smoker, usually a type 2 diabetic, who presents to your clinic with complaints of pain in both of his calves while walking. The presentation to clinic is key because another piece of this whole PAD or peripheral arterial disease picture is patients that have either rest pain, which is pain when they're just sitting there in their feet, or patients that have wounds. Patients with rest pain or patients with wounds have critical limb ischemia, which is not intermittent claudication, and they tend to present to the emergency department, or you might suddenly get a consult from an inpatient who has these types of symptoms. However, an intermittent claudication typically patient will present in your clinic, because this is a patient that can book an appointment and take the time to come to that appointment without any urgency of their symptoms. The types of questions that you want to ask a patient that you consider may have intermittent claudication are as follows. You want to ask the patient how far they can walk before the pain begins and how far they can walk before the pain goes away when they start walking again. The reason that you ask that question is sometimes in these patients, they may have back pain that's radiating to the foot and it is not intermittent claudication. Patients with back pain may say something like, when I go shopping, I lean forward on my shopping cart and I walk and it alleviates the pain. This is a patient that does not have intermittent claudication. Rather, they have potentially spinal stenosis that is alleviated by them leaning forward. However, a patient that states that I can only walk a few steps or half a mile and I have so much pain I have to sit down and then the pain goes away, that's a patient that may have intermittent claudication. It's important to also ask if the pain radiates anywhere. Sometimes patients with osteoarthritis may have bilateral hip pain that radiates to their knees and that could be confused for intermittent claudication when in fact again it's an orthopedic issue. You also want to ask the patient if indeed they have any wounds or if they feel any pain at rest when they are not walking. This patient is not an intermittent claudication. Rather, they are a patient with critical limb ischemia and they need to be managed completely differently. I will give another talk on critical limb ischemia, but for the purposes of this talk, if indeed a patient has wounds or rest pain, they go into a completely different category of management and workup. The other very important point to ask patients is whether or not they are smokers. I put a picture of smoking cessation on this slide because it is indeed that important. Smoking cessation is a cornerstone of management in patients with intermittent claudication.
Now you move on to the clinical exam after you've taken the history. And I put a foot on this picture because I want to show you that the clinical exam may appear completely normal. This is a normal foot, normal color, potentially normal temperature, possibly even pulses. However, the patient may be complaining of this intermittent claudication, this intermittent cramping when they walk. It's important to note, again, if their wounds are rest pain, this is not an intermittent claudicant. However, in a patient who has a completely normal physical exam, they may very well be an intermittent claudicant. So we go on to the imaging, which is part of the crux of diagnosis in conjunction with the actual uh, um, history. There are three important things to consider in imaging. First, the ankle brachial indice and the toe pressure. Sometimes in these diabetics, their ankle brachial indice is not appropriate because they have so much plaque lining sometimes even their tibial arteries that we can't get a good reading on the ankle brachial index. But the toe pressure will give you an idea of how much pressure is getting to the toe. A toe pressure of 0.3 and above is enough for the patient to heal a wound. However, in intermittent claudicans, you may even have a toe pressure that is completely normal. The PVR is something that is also very important to look at, and in patients that have an abnormal PVR or an abnormal uh, uh, ABI, we note that up to 91.2% of patients may have an abnormality. The next step in workup is a CT angiogram of the abdomen pelvis with runoff to the toes. Now, this is very important because this is going to show you where the patient has plaque buildup within the arteries. If the patient does have a high creatinine and a CTA is not plausible, then an ultrasound of the vasculature by your vascular lab is also appropriate because the idea is that you just want to ensure that indeed this is intermittent claudication and that indeed the patient has appropriate flow to the foot and potentially conservative management such as a walking program with some medication modifications may be sufficient to cure the patient. In regards to an ankle brachial indices, a normal ankle brachial indice is really anything above 0.9. However, patients who are claudicans typically are the ones that have the widest range of ABIs. The ABI can range anywhere from 0.5 to 0.95 in an intermittent claudicant. Anything below 0.5, you're really starting to talk about rest pain and tissue loss. So a patient typically with intermittent claudication will have an IBI of around 0.5 to 0.6. This is a, a image here of the ABI and the uh, pulse recordings of a patient that indeed does have intermittent claudication on their left leg. As you can see at rest, the patient has a left-sided ABI of 0.59 and an exercise ABI of 0.29. What that means is when the patient is sitting there at rest, they have about 60% of their blood flow going to the leg or 0.95 or uh, 0.8, uh, 0.59, excuse me. But when a patient exercises or walks and you take their ABI immediately after they finish walking, only 30% is getting down to the foot. And that is why they are having intermittent claudication. However, when the patient rests, the ABI goes back up again and they can begin walking again. This is an image here of a patient that I recently treated who indeed had intermittent claudication. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm just telling you uh, um, what I did in this particular patient. Um, he was a patient that we did try exercise uh, therapy and we did try uh, medication modification. However, he was a young 60-year-old uh, patient whose job was being impacted because he could not walk the lengths that he needed to walk in order to perform his duties. As a result, he had, quote, lifestyle limiting intermittent claudication and the risk of doing a procedure on him was worth it. In this patient, as you can see, the profunda is appropriate. However, the SFA, which is right here, peters out quite significantly and then kind of comes back down here. This is a little bit better of an image where you can see that there's a slight bit of flow, just a trickle, but then the SFA really peters out down here. In this patient, he had appropriate tibial flow. In fact, he had three vessel runoff um, with reconstitution of uh, his flow distally, but his SFA or superficial femoral artery had a large occlusion. The management of these patients, as I mentioned, is primarily based around medications, exercise therapy, and modifying those risk factors. In terms of medications, every single patient that comes in with intermittent claudication has peripheral arterial disease and as a result should be on at least 81 of aspirin per day and a high dose statin every single day. A torvastatin at 40 is appropriate. All of these patients, if they do not have rest pain or critical limb ischemia signs and indeed do have intermittent claudication, should be prescribed a supervised exercise therapy walking program or SET.
Supervised exercise therapy essentially includes walking 30 minutes a day continuously or as far as you can walk without pain three times a week and you need to increase to 30 minutes a day every day if possible. What walking does is it stresses the muscles of the leg and it forces blood flow to go down to the foot. Just like working out in a gym, when you work out those biceps, they get bigger. The same way if you work out those legs, if you work out those arteries, more and more collateral flow develops. Walking does not indeed remove the plaque that may be in the SFA, for example, blocking blood flow. However, it really plumps up those collaterals and you would be surprised how amazingly a patient can increase their ABIs just in six months with a solid committed walking program. The walking program is the absolute cornerstone of intermittent claudication. In conjunction with this, patients can sometimes be prescribed something called silastazole. Silastazole is a medication that reduces the calf pain, so it allows patients to walk further. Think of it a little bit like a Band-Aid that's a medication. It doesn't actually do anything for the plaque, but it kind of suppresses some of that pain so the patient can push forward in walking, thereby creating more of those collaterals. It's important to note though for silastazole, there are a number of studies that have come out that specifically say that a patient that has an ejection fraction that is less than 30 to 35 percent should not be prescribed silastazole. So it's important to get an echo on these types of patients in order to ensure that silastazole is an appropriate uh, prescription. Um, as mentioned, when a patient has lifestyle limiting factors, and this is a very subjective thing, a patient who says, my life really includes sitting in front of the TV watching Netflix and walking to my mailbox and I can do that just fine is someone that you should not touch. But a patient that says, hey, I'm a mailman and I walk house to house and I really can't walk more than half a block without my legs really acting up. That's a person that needs to have a conversation with you potentially about intervention after all conservative managements have failed. However, if you're talking on the boards, if you're talking in a medical school class, if you're talking about the best treatment for these patients, the mainstay of intermittent qualification is indeed no procedures. You want to follow up these patients in about six months, especially if they've committed to an exercise therapy program with repeat ABIs. These can increase simply by the walking program, as I mentioned. And of course, if they decrease or if they start to get into rest pain or uh, 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 critical limb ischemia territory, you need to potentially watch those patients closer. But regardless of the ABI, if a patient is clinically better as measured by the fact that they walk longer distances without stopping, then the treatment, the supervised exercise therapy and the medications is deemed successful. This is a key point. This is one of those rare diseases where the imaging is not what you're chasing after. You are really chasing after the patient's clinical symptoms. If the ABIs have decreased, however, and the patient states that their walking is worse and, as I mentioned, impacting the lifestyle, then potentially angioplasty or stenting is appropriate. As I mentioned earlier about that patient that I uh, talked about who was young and was unable to engage in his activities of daily living, including his job, this is a picture here looking on the left side of his SFA that had significant calcification. I got a wire across this by going up and over and through the lesion in the SFA. And then I place stents, as you can see, here's the stent ending here and going all the way down. And then balloon angioplasty, the stents that were placed into this patient's SFA, allowing for what's called, quote, inline flow to that vessel runoff to, in his uh, leg. He had a jump in his ABI from 0.5 all the way up to 0.95 and is currently doing excellent. However, I insisted with this patient that if I was indeed going to stent him, he had to stop smoking, which he did successfully do, and that he had to engage in an exercise therapy program even after I was done stenting him to really pump up those collaterals because stents don't last forever and neither does balloon angioplasty. So it is possible that these stents could sometime go down. However, if he's really worked on his walking, his collateral blood flow will pump up and that will be something that he can rely upon if indeed his stents ever were to someday go down. In conclusion, the approach to an intermittent claudication patient in your clinic or whenever you meet them is to first determine if this is indeed intermittent claudication. Make sure there are no wounds, make sure there's no rest pain, and make sure that the patient doesn't have any back issues that can explain or orthopedic issues that can explain the leg pain. Make sure that indeed the patient is saying to you that, hey, I'm fine at rest, but when I walk, I get this crampy pain in my calves. One may be worse than the other. And 
I need to do something about that. Get baseline ABIs at that time and potentially a CTA with abdomen and pelvis view with runoff to the toes so that you know exactly where the plaque buildup is in the patients. Typically for intermittent claudications, the majority of their plaque buildup will be in their SFA. Sometimes they may even have plaque buildup in their common femoral artery and that may lead to a femoral endarterectomy in these patients if indeed, the, again, the walking program fails. Advise these patients strongly to uh, stop smoking and optimize their medical therapy, namely their diabetic control, ensure that they're on an aspirin and provide a high dose statin. Refer them to a supervised exercise therapy program specific to peripheral arterial disease if possible, which is basically 30 minutes of uninterrupted walking three times a week to start. Advise the patients to walk through the pain. Tell them that that pain is normal and that they're trying to build up those collaterals, but ensure that they're safe and that walking through the pain doesn't result in them falling. A great thing to tell patients is to walk in the mall as that's a flat surface and that's somewhere where the temperature can be controlled and they can walk for hours. Avoid procedures in these patients unless the patients come back to you with lifestyle limiting claudication, in which case, as mentioned, procedures can include anything from removal of the plaque, sometimes angioplasty and stenting of an occluded external iliac artery, or sometimes crossing an occluded SFA and angioplasting that. Patients with intermittent claudication rarely go on to have wounds and rest pain. Approximately 5 to 20 percent of patients will go on to have significant problems with their legs. So you're not doing a disservice to the patient to follow them and ensure that their ABIs increase with the walking program and optimization of medical therapy. Thank you very much for your time. I hope that you enjoyed this talk and you learned something from it. Bye.